This morning, parents found their daughter lying in a pool of blood. It becomes an instant headline, but then it becomes something extremely unusual. They lost their daughter. They got lynched by the media. If you want the truth, you have to let all the evidence come forth. Talwar family hai, bahut bade log hai, powerful log hai. Something really wrong with this family. We have no idea what actually happened. Thank you very much, Your Honor, and uh, good afternoon to you. The narrative of this case up to this point has been very, very simple. A group of uh, bungling, incompetent cops from a small town in upstate New York, on a razor-thin amount of evidence, brought a case against a man, perhaps insidiously motivated by the color of his skin. Great TV, great theater, but ultimately it's not about tunnel vision, rush to judgment, the defendant's race. It's about 30 minutes in Potsdam. 4.53 p.m. to 5.23 p.m. on Monday, October the 24th, 2011. The death of a child is always tragic. There is pain and grief and there is sorrow. And with that pain and sorrow, there is naturally a cry for justice. A cry for someone to be held accountable. But it must be the right person. to both attend college and I felt right at home right away the first year. It was very homey, it was very simple, that small town feel where everybody knows everybody and you just live your daily life. We found our apartment at 100 Market Street at the beginning of the summer of 2010. It was not like your typical college apartment. It was clean. <laughs> It looked like you could live in it, and it was homey. And uh, the whole building was well kept, and it was, felt very safe. You're sharing a wall with somebody, so we could hear the muffled noises. But I didn't really know a lot about what was going on on the other side. And I knew that there was two young boys. Definitely you could hear a skateboard going down the hallway sometimes, some footsteps, some, you know, you could hear them talking back and forth. We knew we really didn't have much in common with them, two boys that were 12 and younger and a single mother, us two college kids, we didn't really have too much to talk about. I'd seen Garrett, I believe it was his little brother with him, on their little scooters in the front parking lot, driving all around. Andrew and I started dating. He lived with his parents at 100 Market Street Apartments in the back building. It's cozy, quiet, and everybody knows everybody. like 
now we have a connection with this family that we don't even know. And we'll always have that. It was just a normal day. I actually came home earlier than I was normally coming home at that time. I arrived home around 4.15, 4.20, and we started to cook dinner. Actually, Sean cooked dinner. The whole process took about half an hour. So about 5 o'clock, everything got plated up, and we went to our bedroom to eat and watch a TV show. We watched Dexter. We're big fans. It was around five o'clock, right before dinner time. We were outside of the back building changing Andrew's tire. He was down on the ground. We were standing there. He was underneath the car with the jack lifting it up. While Andrew was underneath the car, I kept hearing multiple noises, could not figure out what it was. I kept looking up there, couldn't see anything. While we were watching the show and eating, we weren't really chit-chatting anymore, so we were just listening to the show, and that's when we heard the running and um, the crash. There was silence after the crash. And a few seconds later, uh, we heard a moan for help. And it sounded like either ow or no. It was definitely a child's voice, but it sounded scared. And it sounded, you know, muffled through the wall. But I could hear that word help, and I will never forget that word. Just, I sounded scared. This isn't really the time to ignore it and just think nothing happened. When I knocked on the door of the other apartment, sorry, <laughs> when I knocked on the other door, I heard a slight noise behind the door. I couldn't tell you what it was, but then I heard a click. And it was one of those things where my mind instantly knew that it was a lock clicking. She turned around immediately, and I could see in her eyes that she was not comfortable with whatever it was she heard or felt. Hi, San Police, Dispatcher Schneider. Hi, um, my name is Marissa Vogel, and I have something I'm not sure if I should call or not. I thought I heard um, some screaming, like no and help a couple of times, so I knocked on their door and I heard the lock click. And I'm, I know this sounds really paranoid and stuff, but I figured I'd call just in case. Because, Where do you live? Sorry, 100 Market Street, North Country Manor Apartments. It sounded like something fell and then it was either no or help. So I, it, was, it was a little weird. Okay, I'll have somebody check on it. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Within a few minutes, a police officer had arrived on the scene. We heard him walk up the stairs, knock on the door to the other apartment. 640, the other. 1716. Hello? Hi, is this Rick Dumas? Yes, it is. So I set a patrol up thinking that they might open the uh -huh. door for a patrol, but he's not getting an answer. Well, I'm in Potsdam. Um, I got to drop uh, my niece and nephew off at basketball and my wife, and I can run over there. I've got a key. Okay. location could you assist me by going down and waving down the rescue squad when they arrive yes I could do that. thank you very much I believe they left the door open because I could hear their voices I couldn't hear what they were saying but I could hear that they started to sound a little um can you give it any more information I'm, I'm gonna start CPR. Uh, unresponsive um, male probably 10 years old no pulse not breathing that's about really all we got um, I couldn't tell you how long the rest of it took. It seemed like a whirlwind. It was just once everybody was there, there was people running up and down the stairs, and the gurney went up, and um, 
then they took Garrett down and it kind of seemed as though everything stopped. The mother is Tansy Cyrus. Um, we don't know the child's name at this time. She's not here, we haven't been able to locate. Okay, isn't yeah. she John Jones' ex-girlfriend? Yeah. wonder if he's got a number. I don't know, he might not. Maybe call him and find out. Hey, where's this? This is 100 Market Street, and the mother, we found out, is Tandy Cyrus. Okay. So it's her 10-year-old son. Tandy Cyrus, how do I know her? I think it's John Jones' old girlfriend. Okay, yeah. Who was there with the child? N nobody. It's, to my knowledge, nobody. And I think they just transported. Um, I mean, uh, give me a call. Let me know. I'd like to know what they think happened. Um, well, I think they were hoping that, that, that well... I guess they were looking for direction. Do you want to call Sean's cell phone and talk to him directly, or? Hi, this is Nancy Rutledge. I'm the supervisor at the mm -hmm. hospital. Obviously, we're here with this young child that was just brought in. Yep. We, the re rescue squad gave us an insurance card of a woman named Tandy Cyrus. I'm saying working they, on it. They think that's the mother. Yeah, I'm trying to get in touch with her right now. I think I got a phone call from Tandy about 6.08, stating, could you run over to the hospital? She goes, I'm headed there now. Some parents, I guess, apparently told her, where have you been? Something's happened to Garrett. You need to get to the hospital. And then she immediately thought of me first and called me because, uh, um, you know, I've always been dependable with Tandy. She can count on me. And I was out back, and I heard my aunt scream, and you knew something wasn't right. And she said, get to the hospital. Something's wrong with Garrett. So I think my mother... Tandy and myself, and I went into the room. And when I got in there, I see him laying there. They had him on a breathing machine, and I took his hand, and I gave him a kiss on the forehead, and I said, come on, bud, for Grandma. And he coded. We went in, hugged him, kissed him, had to leave. We didn't know what had happened. Nobody concluded that, you know, a person had done this. We just didn't know what had happened. It's pretty unfair, I guess. That somebody could do that to him. Do you come here? I used to come every single day. Now I come up usually once a week until it gets nice weather. And then I up them up and have coffee with them in the morning, just thinking and drinking my coffee. Oh, it's just like it happened yesterday. And <sighs> every year, too, the boys bring up like a new soccer ball and they all sign it, his classmates, and they bring that up and put it up there. Garrett stayed with us a lot. We know so much. I miss Garrett. That kills me. I felt that I wasn't going to be the father to him, but try to be the best uncle I can be. The last Tuesday, that he was alive. I always would go up, see him before he'd go to sleep, give him a kiss. All my kids and Garrett were cuddled right up. I was gonna grab my phone, take a picture, I never did. We weren't thinking it's the last time that 
you're gonna see him alive. But I still got the memory, so you can't ever take that away. I have a younger brother. He was a senior in high school. I was helping uh, coach his varsity soccer game. It was senior night, so my parents were there. And it was inclement weather. It was rain off and on. I checked my phone near the end of the game, and I had a, a voicemail and a missed call from work. Hi, you reached Mark Murray. I can't answer your call right now. Please leave me a detailed message, and I'll get back to you. Hi, Mark. It's Robin. I have both units on scene with an unresponsive 10-year-old male. CPR in progress. Looking for you or the chief to call me back. Left immediately and got there as fast as I could. Obviously, it's, it's immediately suspicious, so there's a lot of questions in your mind, like why does a 12-year-old just, just doesn't die? We had the state police were called immediately. Notifications were made. We had no idea what we had. They knew somebody had jumped out that window before Garrett died, that they were sure somebody exited that window. The scene was handled as a potential crime scene, so there were a lot of things already in play. I remember a lot of other members of the state police had responded. It wasn't until later that evening we'd went downstairs I realized the area was taped off with caution tape and there was cops there. And I was like, Andrew, that's where we heard the noise, so maybe we should tell somebody. And that's when we figured out it was actually a murder. Hey, is the chief in? This is Scott Hector, Lieutenant with the State Police. Well, I think we're going to hold the scene now yeah. at this point and try to come back in the morning, first thing in the morning. They're going to try to, you know, let yeah. uh, daylight out and try to get everything else they can. And uh, uh, the autopsy is uh, sick of records and do it down, I think, uh, tomorrow at 3. That's a freaking tough one. Holy crap. Yeah. I think we were just all in shock and and uh, didn't know how to take it. And I believe it was three or four hours later that I I had called my girlfriend. I said I'm going to stay with Tandy and assist her through this difficult time. Overnight, it came to be Gary Snow from the state police had stopped on his way home because he resides in the Parishville community as well. It's a tight-knit community. I think he had stopped at the family's house. They had their suspicions. They said the only person, they can't think of anyone who would want to hurt Garrett, number one. There were some things about Tandy's ex-boyfriend, Nick Hillary, that really concerned them. And so they shared those concerns with him. 100% Hillary is responsible for Garrett's death. The day I die, I will go to my grave. 100% Hillary was the killer. Garrett didn't like him. Those two butted heads. I know Garrett had difficulties in school, but there's more to, to life during the week than go to school, come home, be in your room, no TV, no outside play, bull crap. I think that's excessive discipline. Tuesday, October 25th, 2011. The time, 6. 44 a.m. Potsdam Police Dispatcher, over. Hi, good morning. This is Janie Hobbs calling from the Potsdam Middle School. Hello. Hi. Um, we had a student pass away last night, mm -hmm. sixth grade student. We're um, wondering if you could, someone on the PD could possibly get messages to the crossing guards to at least let them know that that has happened. Keep an extra close eye on the children uh, crossing this morning. Just calling, I just uh, keep getting all these tip calls, and I'm not sure what to tell the viewers about something on Market Street there. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any information that I can give out. Dan, what's up? Marky, just calling to say if you need anything from our office, you know, don't hesitate calling. You have um, the all the suspects that are involved. There's just one. I don't know, Dan. It's we. Uh, 
the uh, state police have been phenomenally great in assisting oh, gotcha. uh, uh, Gary Snell. Obviously, him and both, his brother are both here. They both have strong ties to Parishville and the Phillips family, so they were able to. I talked to Gary Lee last night, and we got some some strong feelings about certain people um, or one person. But there there were some some interviews that kind of that they they did last night to kind of cut off the heads of any accusation that some kids were with them and stuff. So it's looking. We we need that autopsy today, and we need the cause of death. But there's one person in particular that we want to talk to. So. This is news from North Country Public Radio. There's not much more to tell yet about the death of a 12-year-old boy in Potsdam Monday. Rumors that his death was the result of an assault have circulated, but this morning a spokesman at the Potsdam Police Department could neither confirm nor deny those reports. The department plans a press conference at 10. Potsdam Police Dispatcher, over. There's something serious going on. There is, but I'm not releasing anything at this point. There have been theories that he had been horsing around with some friends, that some friends were at the house with him, and that this resulted in his death. There had been another theory that stepped beyond that, said that this might have been some kind of, where they're playing a game called uh, Knockout, I think it was, and this could have ended up with, you know, an accidental death. Uh, Autoerotic asphyxiation, someone had said at one point, because they said there had, and if you look at the list of evidence that was found, there was a bra on the floor. And what ended up happening, we learned, is that all of those things were being pushed aside and that they did have one person that they were interested in and they thought that it was the most feasible uh, suspect and or person of interest in Nick Hillary. So all the other theories were pushed aside. The next morning, the local radio station, the commentator reported that there was basically a case of, you know, peer-on-peer -peer violence that resulted in his death, like a bu almost like a bullying situation. And that's how many things were out there as far as these rumors and, and just wild... Um, facts that were either untrue or just misreported. Um. Hey, that is Mark. Hi, Mark. The press is reporting all over about uh, this is a beating by you. Um, so I guess I'm trying to call and get something. We haven't spoken to the media at all. Um, we haven't even formally interviewed the uh, victim's mother yet. We're doing that right now. Obviously, we're doing everything we can right now to be down the bottom of this. Um, we're trying, we're looking at every angle we possibly can. Uh, we have state police up there, we up there last night, we up there again. They're uh, trying their special crimes and up there, gathering what they can for evidence. Um, Danny's going to try to get some subpoenas so we get cell phones. Find out what kind of conversations with cell phones and friends, what we're all just a few cell phones. Basically, just officially notified her that this this was looking like a homicide and just gathered as much inf information that we could. I know that I, I sat and took notes while she answered all the questions we could think of. In, okay, in the, the last contact you had with the Arab was what time? Is that what he called you or you called him? Okay. He was at that school at the time? And what was the, the conversation? They asked if Tandy would come down, and I said, do you want me to come with you? And absolutely. I asked him if they had any problems with me coming down. Absolutely not. So I, I went down with Tandy that morning. She wanted that, and that was accommodated. To do it over again probably would have done differently, but it, I don't, it definitely didn't affect the investigation, in, in my opinion. Um, obviously, one person probably we're interested in speaking to the community. Oh, well, okay. Uh, we got a great discussion yesterday just to try to get a... I knew where he said he was. Later in the night after the murder, I remember being back at the station and uh, my chief at Tischler poked his head in my office and said, we need to get a hold of um, Tandy's ex-boyfriend, uh, Nick Hillary. Hello? Oh, is Mr. Hillary there, please? Mr. Hillary speaking. It's Mark Murray, the Potsdam Police Department. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, and you? 
Not too bad. Uh, we had an incident uh, occur this evening, and we'd like to speak with you in, in regards to it. Um, there was an incident with Tandy's uh, 10-year-old son, and I didn't know if you'd be able to come to our station and speak to us really quick about it. Oh, sure. I knew who he was at that point in time, but I didn't know him personally. He was the soccer coach for Clarkson University, for the varsity men's team. As a coach, you know, everybody knew who I was. Wherever you go, people would identify. People would say, hey, hey coach, what's going on? How, how's the season? What do you expect? You know, small talks and stuff like that. You know, there's an old phrase that everybody likes a winner. Nobody likes a loser. So, you know, when I was on the winning side, it, it, it was unbelievable. I was very successful as a soccer player at the collegiate level, and I think those accomplishments, I will always be forever grateful to the guys who I have played with, the guys who have laid the foundation before myself. Well, I first met Nick back in 1996. I was a senior in high school, and he came to Brooklyn and uh, started talking to me about St. Lawrence. As far as my soccer journey, St. Lawrence was it. Uh, we lived in a house called the House of Brotherhood, about five of us uh, Jamaicans. It was known as a soccer house. Everyone knew who they were because there was a bunch of really good Jamaican guys from the city up in Canton, New York, like just beating everybody up on the soccer field. I think he lost two games or three games his entire four years there. They won the national championship. Obviously, he got hired at Clarkson because he's familiar with the area, he's familiar with the recruiting, familiar with the teams you'd be playing, his outstanding history in the area. So, yeah, in the small soccer community that was out of St. McCann, yeah, they knew who he was. You know, I, I met Tandy in uh, 2010. I would normally hang out with the, uh, the coaches from the college, you know, after work or after a game. I'll sit at the bar where she was a bartender. She would admire what I was doing and she would ask questions and, you know, she played soccer so she understood, you know, the language and what I was doing. So that, that's how my meeting of Tandy all came about, was during that time period. a little bit of mixed opinions, I guess. Gossip, small town, no, oh, I can't believe they're dating, or that's weird. I think one of the key reasons why we became so fond of each other so quickly was because she was very open-minded, was very caring. She's a mother too, you know, at the time I had three. We found a, a house that was big enough, and that's how we end up moving in together.
And obviously, I, I would not like that for my child. And I don't think it was fair for her and her son to have to experience that. And I think that was one of the, um, the root cause as to why we made the decision that, you know, it would be best if she has her own aboard and I have my own aboard. What was the reason for the breakup? Um, They talked about going their separate ways is what she had told me and, and I said, you know, well, why don't you start looking for your own place? I know some people that own apartments. So I gave a call and they said, yeah, we got a place at 100 Market Street. I looked at it as the convenience of not being close to me. It was the convenience for the boys. I, I guess I always put the boys first. Here's an opportunity for them to start a new life. As far as I knew that her and Nick were not seeing each other, but um, I was enlightened that, uh, you know, uh, they were kind of hanging out once in a while, occasionally. Obviously, it's a small community, so now everybody would be saying, okay, all right, so she's living with her two sons and he's living with his daughter. That would have taken the pressure off the kids. I mean, no one would have to know that we have a relationship going. Um, but, you know, with every separation comes a reassessment, and we figured that in the best interest of, of the kids and everyone, you know, we'll just be friends. And that's how it actually ended. He was the, the last, her ex-boyfriend, and there were issues about their breakup that specifically were cited to be about Garrett. And I guess that's when you start, your suspicion starts building at that point. Yes. Yeah, you just called just now, but I have my kids here with me. Is it possible that you could come on down to my house and speak to me? Um, where do you live? Uh, Meadow East. Okay, what number in Meadow East? Apartment E6. E6? Yeah, sure. Sat on the couch across from Nick. Looks like he was freshly showered, wearing socks, sandals, like some athletic pants and a, a sh long sleeve shirt. Ian Fairley, his assistant coach, um, went outside. There's like a porch that, with all windows. We weren't there very long, uh, five, ten minutes. That was the first time I learned that he had passed that night when the cops came to my apartment and told me that he had passed away. Um, You're sitting on his outdoor porch, and that's when he said, Garrett, Garrett had died. There was just silence. We just silent. Neither of us spoke for a while. Just kind of just sinking in, like, whoa. And that, that, that was just a very numbing feeling. Um, knowing that, you know, it's not like he was sick. And to, to have learned that he just passed away, and there was no reasons given or anything like that, um, yeah, I mean, I was at a loss for words. Um, and I frantically start figuring out, you know, reaching out to Tandy, reaching out to the family members, trying to find out what was going on. So I was making phone calls. Nick called me late that night. The sound in his voice, it was, it was weird. You know, he just sounded down and depressed. And then, you know, he told me, you know, Garrett died. And, and then he told me, you know, the cops came and told him. And right there, that was when, <laughs> you know, the lawyer and me kicked off. And, and I thought there was something very strange about that. I would not say it's normal to give an ex a uh, death notification. I reached out to Tandy and I never heard back from Tandy.
out my mind he did it. And I don't base that strictly on wanting to say it's him. I base it on the knowledge of many of the guys I work with in law enforcement that investigated this and put 20 hours plus a day into trying to find the right person to put to this. And uh, each one of them told me, next the guy. The time, 11.43 a.m. Hi, Ed. Hey, Ed, how's it going? How you doing? Oh, we're hanging in there. Yeah. Do what we can do. Appreciate all the help, though. Uh, uh, State Police are uh, helping us with right now. I mean, without you guys, it would be... We'll help you in any way we can, you know. We gotta, we want to get this one right. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. If you know what I mean? It's uh, we got a 12-year-old that lost his life. we got to lock yep. somebody up. And we have a strong suspect at this point. Um, yeah. And uh, we're just trying to get all the ammunition against him at this point. We can... Okay, we've got a dead 12-year-old, and the first 48 hours of this are critical, and we have a killer on the run, and we have to find out who did this. So you can understand the police's viewpoint. And yet, you do also have to raise questions as to why they chose Nick Hillary, why he was the guy, what sort of evidence they were working with, what sort of tips they were working with. Were they following other tips? Were there other suspects? Were there other people that as they were focusing so heavily on Nick, they could have gotten away. Neighbors say they heard loud noises coming from the apartment where Phillips was found dead. Um, we were changing his tire and we kept hearing this ripping noise. And 30 minutes after coming inside, we come to find out that the police were here. And it's kind of depressing knowing that maybe if we stayed down there five more minutes, the person would have been caught. I do believe whoever murdered Garrett Phillips left the scene after 5.20. I heard maybe Garrett didn't get along with a few kids and that it could have been one of them, but it was very brief and nobody mentions it to this day. There's not a lot to do in the town, so they go to the park, they hang out, you know, they do things they shouldn't be doing. They get in big groups because there's nothing else to do. I don't know where they came up with the name Nick Hillary. I don't know if it was because he was African-American or if they actually had a lead on him, but I think he was the easiest target. I think the media makes it seem that we're racist, but I don't think we necessarily are. There's just not a lot of African-Americans compared to a city. A couple things that always strike me about this part of the world. One is that there's no easy way to get here. It is almost impossible to get here quickly, which I think for some people that live here is, is the appeal. You know, you, you have a place that is removed. Uh, you have a place that has a great deal of natural beauty. If you like farmland, this is a nice place to live. You can pick up a house here pretty cheap. For a long time, there were pretty decent jobs. You know, there was sandstoning and kind of light manufacturing. Um, What's happened, however, in the last few decades is that those types of jobs have dried up and a kind of real economic depression has set in here. And with some of that, you've had, for lack of a better word, more cosmopolitan problems coming to town. You've got heroin in some of the larger towns. You've got high unemployment in a lot of these towns. You've got uh, people that are struggling. There's a lot of drugs here. And there have been uh, in Messina, had a real issue with heroin. We had Augsburg had a, a problem with uh, crack cocaine. And then there were people just, you know, cooking meth all over the place, you know, like these little one-stop shops where people are doing it in their homes and things like that. We talk about the North Country as being really white and remote, but also that, th that Potsdam is situated in New York's prison country. It's a community in an area that kind of like, its lifeblood is corrections. And we think about racial dynamics, how a lot of white people's only interactions with black people are when they're in a uniform as a corrections officer, guarding inmates of color. It's just something to keep in mind. But there's also four colleges, you know, within 10 miles of here. So you've got this really interesting dynamic where you, you do have a certain conservative rural bent to it. Driving up here, you see a Confederate flag here and there. 
But then you also have, you know, college bars and, and college activities and more kind of liberal seeming functions going on around you. See, for me, it's like uh, two folds. Um, the first experience was when I was a student at St. Lawrence. As a student, you had the luxury of the campus community. Then once I came back after graduating St. Lawrence in a faculty slash coaching position in which now you're mentoring young adults and preparing them for the, the real world, you start to interact a lot more with the community. Nick and I were friends prior to Tandy and uh, Nick dating. I don't want to say we were close friends. Uh, we were acquaintances. If we saw each other, we wouldn't have a problem saying hi to each other and what have you. John, John Jones, um, local sheriff guy. Um, someone who's well known in the community as well. I mean, born and raised here. Um, he was Tandy's boyfriend prior to Tandy and I hanging out. They were living together when Tandy and I was first socializing. You know, there was no doubt that she got a lot of attention when she was out there, and I enjoyed that aspect of having a, uh, a woman that people were like, wow, she's good looking. So I enjoyed, you know, I didn't bother me. When Tandy and I started having real difficulties towards the end, I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what's going on, what's happening, and Nick's name was brought up a couple times, and uh, I just happened to be at, a, at the right place, I guess, at the right time to see the two of them drive by one early morning. And uh, so I felt the need to find out for myself if they were dating each other, that I can move on in my life and, and start dating myself. And um, so I confronted Nick at his residence. Knocked on my door, which at the moment I was living here. Um, at this point in time, I had not separated from Stacy, So this was, was like real early in our relationship. But I'm thinking, I mean, I wouldn't even classify my interactions with Tanya at that time as a relationship. We was just friends talking. Nick. Can we be just men here for a minute and just man up and tell me whether or not uh, you two are seeing each other? And he, and he told me absolutely not, that they weren't seeing each other, but that I should talk to Tandy. You know, if he knew that I was dating her, what he would have done, you know, kick my door in, call me names, um, you know, just real threatening. Um, doesn't take someone of much intelligence to figure out that obviously there's something going on there. So um, I text Tandy soon after and said, um, you know, this is it. Grant you, and I mean, this is not something that I'm explicitly proud of. I mean, obviously I was still living here with the mother of my kids. I guess word got to the kid's mom that I was hanging out with Tandy. Apparently, I enlightened Stacy one day to say, how's it going? And she says, good. And I said, you know, are you doing OK with the situation with Nick and, and Tandy? And she was like, what do you mean? So Tandy and Stacy were not cordial. There's some domestic incidents that happened in, in the interim, uh, one in which Stacy was arrested for, um, for cutting up his clothes and dropping them off in the lawn of his apartment. There was an open case. Nick had, had his car keyed. And he wasn't sure if it was you know, John Jones uh, that did it or if it was Stacia that did it. And I, ultimately, I'm not sure who keyed his car. It didn't look very well on him in the community. And obviously, him losing his girlfriend to an African-American, it just, just was just not playing out right. Um, so, you know, that's who John is. He's right out of a movie, next dating the sheriff's, like, ex-girl. <laughs> Well, that's fun, uh, and he's kind of, and he's not being quiet about it. Uh, he's not just letting it happen. And then once Garrett passed, it was like instantly. You know, I was like, all right, here we go. The build-up Tuesday night into Wednesday morning is. You know, we, we got to talk to Nick again. There's just too much. There's too much stuff here. You know, we're clearing everybody else as you know, either alibied or precluded for a very a number of reasons. We've got to find out what's. There's more to this with Nick's involvement. I 
never thought for a second that she would even fathom the idea to want to go along with such a theory, knowing who I am. You spend time with people, and obviously, um, we, we knew each other for, for 12 months. It, it, it would be a difference if, you know, we lived apart, saw each other on occasions, never spent any time in our environment. This, this is a young lady who has traveled to different countries with me. She's been around me 24-7, 365, you know, and I would hope that the person that she has been around that entire time, even to the point in which we had broken off the relationship, we still maintain civil dialogue. But, you know, people can be manipulated. when she is someone who is born and raised in the town. And obviously, if she has to decide with a group not to be an island in the situation, then obviously I could see why she would want to side with the law enforcement up there. Command post knew that there was a soccer game going on that night. Went to the game just to observe. My observations of him directly, he did have some sort of injury or something. He was favoring his his uh, right leg. Officer Murray had put in his sworn affidavit to get a search warrant, right? So it's sworn to that he observed Mr. Hillary with a significant limp. The day after the murder. The day murder. after the murder while he was coaching a soccer game. And I guess to him, this shows that he could have jumped out the window and injured himself. Years later, we discovered the video. Hillary is walking very well, and he beats a bunch of 19 and 20 year olds to the locker room right. at halftime. So, why would a police officer in the middle of a murder case, only the day after, make up a story about a significant limp when he knows that there's none? There's points in time where he looks like he's walking perfectly fine, and there's points in time where you, you, you wonder if, if he's trying to conceal or, or he's got a sore leg. It's significant to me, like that looks like he's, he's favoring his right leg. Um, it's not like he had to amputate it. I was contacted by a lawyer who basically said that there was a case that he viewed as a railroading of a black man in northern New York. And the essential idea there was that this guy had uh, kind of a spotless record. He was a military veteran. He was a member of the community. He was a star athlete. He had a promising career as a coach. Uh, and that there was no indication that this guy would be capable of this type of crime. And yet things were moving forward fairly rapidly. They ordered me down to the station the Wednesday morning. I get a call from Nick saying, the police are at my door. Right away, um, it wasn't alarm bells as much as, um, you know, an explosion that went off in my brain. And I knew right then, right there, that they were about to frame the killer for murder. You know, as person of color, oftentimes you're told, don't talk to the police, just because. But not having anything to worry about, I want to be as helpful as possible because this is a young man that has lived with me, lived around my kids, has definitely has a part of my history He's inside there. So obviously, you know, whatever I could do to help you guys resolve this situation, I'm on board. Um, why don't you just 
can buy some of this information. It's right there and all that. Well, I mean, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, if you gotta read them, right? Well, we don't have to. We don't have to. Instead of just going here, it's kind of it's not really just a bloody situation. Anyways, you're not under arrest. Let's get to the case. Okay. Yes, please. Um, how long have you gone out with Tandy? I've been seen Tandy since September last year. I think a lot of these cops who were involved felt as though. If Nick could steal our friend's woman, then what about ours? I mean, she's a good looking girl, obviously, and draws attention. You know what I mean? Is there a lot of people that express a big interest in her? Or that you're aware of any reason? I'm, I'm aware of some. I know several people have always liked her, you know? I mean, that's, that's the thing that I can't, I can't really say. You know? Obviously, when you're dealing with the death of a 12 year old boy, you know, we can't, we got to talk about this stuff. We can't just throw it out the window and pretend it doesn't exist. Um, all bets are off. Did you break up with her? Did she break up with you? Or what's the deal with that? We separated. Separated. It's not one of those relationships where people break up and there's hostility. You know, it was never like that. Quite the opposite. You know, so it was very surprising to me to, to, to have learned all these stories as to what was going on with our relationship. It wasn't like that, that he, he wanted her back. And I can't believe for a second, you being his like best friend in the world, it seems like, at least in this area of the world, that you wouldn't know that. And if, it, if we're getting the wrong impression from these other people, then I'm not doing my job very good because that's exactly the impression I'm getting. Went down to the police station. I actually noticed Nick's SUV in there, so I was like, "All right, just ask him." You know, Nick's down here. Is he a kind of player, kind of guy, or you know, not judging him or anything? Well, uh, it's it's tough to tell because I mean he's I mean he's very outgoing. He's always smiling, always laughing. So I mean I think people get that impression, but it's not like he's just like, people are just kind of jacking to him. Yeah, it's, well, exactly. I mean he's just like kind of a yeah. He's a great guy to talk to. Like I said, he's always laughing and always smiling, so it's hard not to you know, yeah. be attracted to him. But as far as kind of, you know, like meeting girls or anything, I, I mean, right. he, talks to, he talks to females. But he doesn't have a problem, yeah. Yeah, but I think it's not like I see him just take people back all the time. You know, he'll be in the bars with them or, you know, mm -hmm. people over at his house when he was with stage here at Tandy. Never, you know. Was Tandy more special, you think, or do you think she was just kind of a little more of a, in the long line of, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I know, but he never talked to me about like, wanting to marry her. No, never, never talked. To me. Was he pissed off that they weren't, that things weren't going well? Well, I mean, yeah, it's kind of being the end of the relationship. So, but, I, mean, you, I definitely talked to him a little bit about it. I kind of said he, he definitely liked her, and they were still communicating a lot. And I think they were trying to patch things up and see if maybe you know they could keep things going uh, when they were living. Separately, but then you know, just kind of started fizzling out, and they started talking less. And then it was just like, all right, let's just mm -hmm. not talk at all. And she wanted her space, and he was okay. Same questions. Um, Nick's background, how I knew Nick, how I knew Garrett, how I knew Garrett, how I knew Tandy. How did, that same questions, just kind of relationship building, like how, what I knew about the relationships. Did you usually pick up your kids from school. Okay. Really? 
you know, we're we're hardly informed here, and I don't like, I don't like, like this is a, this is the most informal like a thing. We're here, the little moon is here. It's like you, you, us, you and Gary. That's it. The, uh, okay. If we want to make it, if we wanted to treat you as like what you're saying, as a suspect, it'd be a lot different situation. I mean, what, what, you know what you did on Monday? I mean, Monday was the first day of the week, two days ago. This isn't hard, man. This is not. This is, these are simple questions, okay? Our timeline is such that um, we talked to you before and you mentioned you were at practice. What time was practice on Monday? Do you remember? I have no comments. No comments on what practice was? No comments. See you again, Mark. That, that, just, that, just, that just strikes me as, like, I don't understand, like, what, what, what do you think we're, we're asking here? It's pretty clear into the interview that he is only there to talk about these students, he's not going to answer any other questions. I think I asked him, you know, what time was practice that day for you? And he's like, uh, no comment. I'm, and this struck me as odd. Let us just be frank. Please, okay. Well, let's, okay. If you want to be frank, go ahead and be frank. Okay. You asked me to come down here to do what? To look at the students. Raise the list of students. Okay. We're good. Stop by the court. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, let's, not, let's not turn nasty over anything. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. What's your name again? Gary. It's Gary, Gary, yeah. former soldier in his 30s. Uh, he was a teacher. He was a coach. He was a graduate of a very good university. So you're not dealing with the Central Park Five or a bunch of 16-year-olds or 13-year-olds who you can put words in their mouth and try to convince them that something is what it's not. If I got myself in a bad situation, he's a smart guy. I already know that. So a smart guy, that's probably what he's going to start thinking is, oh man, I fucked up bad, I need, to, I need an alibi, I need somebody. But do you, do you get that impression? Um, no, I mean, I don't get the impression that he did, so I don't think... Let's just say he did, let's just say he did. I mean, that he would come to me for an out, like, to, to like, create a solid alibi, is that what you're saying? Yeah, like, was it weird that he stand by? Keep getting asked, how do you know he didn't do it? Well, if he did do it, then... I saw him a minute later, and he was the same person I've always met, just walked in and was like, hey, going to the, going to the office, got this meeting, you're going to be right behind me? Yeah, be right there, just every other day, no big deal. Anything at all seem different to you, or, like, like coach coming by your house, is that normal? Or? Yeah, like, I mean, he does that quite a bit, he lives right there, so yeah, if he sees my car outside, he'll just come right in. So I'm his alibi. I'm why he can't be there because he was here at 521, uh, which is something they grilled me on, you know, a lot uh, throughout the whole process. Well, if it's not a coach, that could be enough to prove it right there. Because we're talking seconds after this happened when, when he came by your place, do you think? So, I mean, every minute, this is actually important. And the police said they were at the apartment at 524, and he's hearing footsteps. You know, he hears people in the apartment. So that's right around the time that Nick's at my place. I mean, I don't question that. That's a pretty good, to have him have a phone call, the time is good. Um, but you know, what is Mark Wentworth hearing? 
I mean, this, this poor guy is tormented over this for the last five years into current day saying, you know, did I hear the blinds in the wind? Did I hear, you know, is he hearing Sean Hall pace back and forth up this, this rickety hallway while, you know, we're waiting for a key holder to get there? Andrew's car was directly below the window in the corner of the building. There's a little divot and it goes in. We are right there by the dumpsters with a great view of the window. We were downstairs around 4.50 to 5.20. Where in this window of time does this person escape? It's just remarkable. It's like, how does this happen? How does this person get out this window and run off and not seen by anyone? I think whoever it was was terrified that we weren't going to leave, and they did get very lucky that we did leave and they were able to escape without being seen. The text messages said we were downstairs around 4.50 to 5.20. choice, which is to either put my hand on you to actually leave, 
or bull my way through the door, which those two options provide me nothing good in return. So obviously I have succumbed to what you guys are doing and knowing intentionally what you're doing and just sit there. Hey, you can call your attorney and do whatever you want to do, but in the meantime, we're going to apply for a search warrant to get permission to photograph your body, okay? Um, just like I told you, Nick, this, this, this doesn't have to be the end of the world. I understand you. that, but look, you guys brought me down here. I got a press conference. I got a press conference at 10 o'clock. It's almost it's quarter to 10. Do I tell the press we're still working on this investigation is pending, or do we tell them we have someone what in custody? Is, I don't know. You that, tell me. Well, you're making my decision pretty easy by, okay. by walking out and telling me you're not going to talk to me. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not refusing to talk to you. Yes, it's something we can still work Listen on. What I'm I'm you. Listen what I'm saying to you. You tell them it's still pending. This is not anything you meant to do. Mark, I know Mark, that. Mark, Mark, listen, Mark, 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 listen, listen Mark, to me. I'm sorry. I'm not refusing to talk to you guys. All I'm saying is, when you came to my house this morning, yes. was I working? No. I was watching DVD. That's what I do. That's all I have to Okay, so you're working. Okay. okay. I was working. I took time out to come and be helpful. Yes. And all of a sudden, it's a different spin. It is a, it is a different yes spin. Yes or no? Absolutely. And I'm saying to you guys, I'm staying willing to cooperate and be helpful. Okay. Well, listen to me then. I'm if here. If you want to be helpful, put your phone down, shut it off, and be helpful with me, okay? Well, then, I want to tell you something about... Garrett, my impression of Garrett. You said you spoke to Garrett before he passed. That's what you told me. Yes. No. Okay? No, that's what you told me. He just confirmed it. That's what you just told okay. me. Listen to me. I said Garrett said something. There's rescue people there. Okay. Okay. Um, you watch CSI at all? DNA? You know anything about that? No. Now you're lying to me. You know what DNA is. I do know what DNA okay. is. Okay, you told me no, but you don't know what DNA is. You asked me if I watch CSI. You ever watch CSI? I haven't seen it. Okay, you lied to me. Listen, <laughs> listen to me, Nick. This, this isn't the kind of thing no, that no, no. this isn't the kind of thing that you can just slide out on and, and not, not face what happened. And then I received a call. He's saying they won't let me leave. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I knew whatever was going on could not be legal or good. Okay, Nick, yeah. we're going to need your phone. Give it to me now. Well, I have to give my phone. We're going to end up taking it, so you're done with the phone calls. You talk to your lawyer. Everybody's going to need your phone. I can't just give you my phone. Please? No. You got to give it to me. She's going to be calling me back. Well, she can call here to TV. Give me your phone. I don't, I don't want to take it from you. This is good. Take a while. We're gonna get hold of the judge. So. I'll sit in here with you. I guess they were working behind the scenes. Now that I know, you know a little bit more about that particular day. They were working behind the scenes and just trying to keep me there for the whole time. I'm serious, this is it. No, we've been, I've been sitting all morning. Well, I have a sitting Your name is? I'm Ray. Ray? Yeah. Hey, man, could I answer that, please? No. Allow me the opportunity, please. Here. Allow me the opportunity, please. Please, please, please. You know what? You guys are really nice. Please, allow me the opportunity. Please, allow me the opportunity. You know, when I decided to, to haul tail from <laughs> New York City all the way up here to to be of assistance to me as a friend. So I got in the car, I started driving. I called my wife, explained to her that I'm taking a drive upstate. Um, so she also was a bit shocked and astonished. From that moment on, I mean, there has not been a day that has passed that Nick Hillary has not been discussed over our morning coffee or nighttime glass of wine. <laughs> I mean, it's been... It's when been it consumes you, yeah. it's, it's in for a penny and for a pound. It's nothing that we planned on uh, getting this much involved in, but, you know, we had to act and we had to move in order to help Nick. 
I mean, I wanted to fight injustice. I, I was working in a bank right after um, St. Lawrence, and you know, you always talk to people, you always give your views on things, and after a while, it's like, you know, you can talk all you want, but why don't, why don't you try to change things? You know, being a lawyer, I thought, was the best way to make a change. Once he invokes his rights and we called an attorney for him, she came and sat with him, he sat at her station, I, I wrote a search warrant, a uh, judge issued the search warrant and we lawfully executed the search warrant. The New York State FIU, it's all on video in my office. The decision was made that there's potentially probative you know, evidence on his body of his person because we know the person that, that killed Garrett Phillips jumped out that window and would potentially have either a, a, a injury that we can document or a marking that we would be able to, to help link to the crime or, or something like that. injury. I mean, at first he tells me he has no ankle injury, there's no issue. Then he has one, and then he comes up with an excuse that he was moving furnitures around his apartment. The last time I sprained my ankle or, or lacerated part of my body with a piece of furniture, I remember what that piece of furniture is. And like, it, it was a goddamn desk, or it was a table behind me, or but what was it? What kind of furniture? Like I said, it was furniture. Do you want to elaborate at all on that? Was it a bed? I mean, I'll ask him to this day. If I if ran into it to Nick, I'd say, Nick, what kind of furniture was it? I don't normally do strip search. This was near state FIU. We normally do searches of people's persons, and this was normal procedure. Uh, trying to document injuries pursuant to the murder of a 12-year-old boy. Um, there were other people that were photographed nude as well, and I pointed that out in the deposition. Um, but who else was photographed nude? Garrett Phillips was. When I got um, to St. Lawrence County, the news that I started getting was just totally unbelievable. All they wanted him to do was to flinch, to refuse to take his clothes off, because then he would have gotten a real beat down and been charged with resisting arrest. So in that spot, in that position, he handled it as best as he could. He took his clothes off. never arrested me and then told me I could leave in a hazmat suit. Eight hours later. I mean, I literally came out of the police station as if my mom had just given birth to me as an adult. Nothing. Well, you don't strip search someone totally naked forever for anything. I mean, unless you have a rape victim saying, I bit his penis. I mean, there, what really would be the use? If you're getting his DNA, you could get his DNA. This is to break him down mentally, to let him know when he walked in that you're done. Like, your life will never be the same. We're going to get you. This is what we can do to you. And there's nothing that you can do about it. Once he got here, I mean, his knowledge base for being in this field kicked in, and that's pretty much when I realized what their plan 
is, which was to to ostracize me within the community quickly, blame me for what had taken place without knowing the facts, and then buried me. It's just one of those situations in which, you know, I mean, even now it's hard to put words to. Because law enforcement seem convinced, because people in the community seem convinced, because members of the family seem convinced. There may have been a rush towards focusing so singly on Nick Hillary. That's what might keep you up at night a little bit, is that if he didn't do it, then who did? And where did he go or she go um, while they were focusing on Nick? I never thought for a minute that the situation was over with after that initial run-in. 